This Steve Jones Show podcast is now loading. The Steve Jones Show podcast is presented by Sunbury Motor Company, Purdy Insurance, Brewers Outlet, and NIL Game Changers. Bringing you an in-depth look at Penn State sports and more. This is the Steve Jones Show on News Radio 1070 WKOK. The Steve Jones Show is presented by NIL Game Changers, Sunbury Motor Company, Purdy Insurance, and Brewers Outlet. Now from the Sunbury Motor Studio, here's Steve Jones. This half hour of the show being brought to you by NIL Game Changers. Your ultimate destination for name, image, and likeness opportunities. Athlete, business, look, they'll open up the doors for you. Get your journey started today at NILGameChangers.org. And now we transition to the outstanding Neil Kulong, sir. Always uh, the most valuable half hour of the week. The pleasure is all on my end. Thank you, as always, for having me. Okay, so uh, we've now taken a long look at a game in the preseason where we got to see the quarterbacks, including Russell Wilson. Uh, How guarded was the Steeler offense, and what did you think of it watching each of them? Um, My my honest takeaway from the whole thing was I I really hope that's not the stuff they're planning to run the regular season. Um, (laughs) Mainly, without going into too much detail, Sean Payton is has been and presumably always will be very much a a high to low read offense guy. Drew Brees is one of the best quarterbacks the game has ever seen because while outstanding in many areas, the one thing he really did well was read uh, from high to low. He he made very quick decisions. He he knew where to go with the ball. Denver had Russell Wilson and with Sean Payton calling plays, designing their offense. He was so inept. Guard. They didn't even just release him. They benched him after mm-hmm. what was it, fifteen games? Yes. And are currently paying him thirty-nine million dollars to not be on their team. Right. I saw Russell Wilson and the Steelers' offense running a lot of high-low reads in that game. And to, to the surprise of nobody who's watched Russell Wilson, um, he failed to pick up a lot of what was going on. He missed a, a, a wide-open play, which probably would have gone for a, 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 a long touchdown on a skinny post that he didn't read correctly. There were others that he didn't. Um, while you know, I'm, I'm not at all going to claim uh, he got uh, all the protection in the world, everything that he needed in that regard, uh, a quarterback's got to make plays. That's why he's there. And in plain and simple, he didn't do it. Um, it was frustrating because in many ways what it feels like is they're trying to implement a style of offense that you have tangible evidence that Russell Wilson doesn't do particularly well. Um, and if that's what you're trying to do, you, you've got two problems mainly. One your quarterback is going to struggle on a team that has had the quarterback struggle for the better part of the last four seasons. Or two, you're going to have to dumb down the entire offense yet again and really not uh, set your your team up for level of success. Mm-hmm. I feel uh, what Arthur Smith was calling, and it's a preseason game, but it wasn't, you know, they didn't game plan, but there there was complexity in what they ran. Uh, maybe not hot routes. Maybe they, you know, they they need to get uh, the throw where it needs to go. That that's what they're practicing. Um, but to run even a a basic offense, you have to have a lot more fluidity than what we saw. And it, it's mm-hmm. new to everybody. Um, they took a step back in a lot of ways. I think from last season, it, you're you're looking at a team that I I don't know if it moved forward, and they made significant changes uh, along that unit and if, if this was if, if this is to be the result of all of those changes you're looking at really kind of the, the same as it's been and I, I don't know how much longer uh, Mike Tomlin can pull nine or ten wins out of a team that doesn't operate at even a, an average level offensively in in this 
era of the NFL. And it, it, it's frustrating to watch uh, overall because I, I think this time they, they do have the offensive coordinator to be able to make things work. But they're not directing it, 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 it would seem to me at least, it, they're not directing it in a way that is um, – Comprehensible for the quarterback that they have, and that that's going to be a problem. I don't, I don't feel that they have taken a step forward, and they absolutely needed to take a step forward at the quarterback position. I, I understand that it's the preseason. This is what we have to go on, though, and I, I don't think anybody thought that looked good. You know, it was, no. it was an absolute train wreck, and um, we're, we're used to saying that after Steelers games nowadays. It's, you know what. You know what this does tell us? I mean, yeah, yeah, obviously he's well retired now. But man, does this tell us over and over again that even in his latter years, to me, how invaluable Ben Roethlisberger was, even if he was 75% of what he had been when he was in his prime? Yeah, I think that if anything, Steelers fans can take away just how valuable um, a, a good quarterback can be. And in Ben's last season, uh, he was hobbled going into the year. He broke down even more by the midway point of the year. Um, he is still head and shoulders above everybody else that they've brought in. Um, I, I'm not saying that they need to go out and find Ben Roethlisberger. I think every team would like to find Ben Roethlisberger if they have a need for a quarterback. Sure. But the the lower level, um, even call it the average level in the NFL, for that position is a bad player. That's just objectively true. Anybody at the, the whatever measurement you want to use, the 16th best quarterback in the league, uh, is is by appearance bad. They're below that and have been um, for for some time now. You know, several games. They're not going to get anywhere with substandard quarterback play. I would have thought it would have been mission critical this off season to marry the offensive concepts that you're running with the skill set of the quarterback that you have. In the past, they, they have not had a quarterback that could do anything, really, which was last season, and it became impossible to come up with any kind of scheme to help them out. Now, it's not uh, that that is not a sign of support for what Matt Canada was calling anyway. That clearly didn't work out. They, they had some success when they moved away from Canada, but still exhibited a lot of the same problems that they've had uh, uh, previously. Now they have the new offensive coordinator. They had an entire offseason to, to, you know, to vet, to plan, to choose. Um, they had you know, some options. Grant's not the greatest options in the world, but mm-hmm. you get a, a financial break with a veteran like Wilson who needs to, to revitalize his career if he's going to get one more big extension. To put those two together playing in a, a, a very similar offense to what he just completely and catastrophically failed in in Denver – I don't even have words to express that. I, I don't understand the line of thinking that goes along with that at all. Uh, I, I will say, though, it, it doesn't mean that that's going to be everything. That's what they're going to do. But I would really hate to see another year of an offense that's basically one read for the quarterback, uh, combo routes not being run by receivers, receivers not getting open, which was another problem, too. Put that alongside the, the protection. Um, plays were there to be made, and they don't have a quarterback. Um, willing or able to get rid of the ball where it's supposed to go and make the right read. and that, That's really what we saw in that game. And I, I can't imagine uh, the Steelers coaching staff is real happy right now because this, this, if, if we see the same type of start as we have in the last, you know, the, the last couple of years over the first four or five weeks of this year, there's going to be a real problem. And I, I, you know, I, I don't know how many more years of this they can take. Well, and that brings me to the next part. I, you know, I brought up the Atlanta Hawks before. Now, this year they did have the first overall pick in the draft based on the lottery. But the team that just either barely makes the playoffs or misses the playoffs but has a winning record drafts lower. And I just feel like the Steelers have been that team under Mike Tomlin that never had a losing record. Right? They have not had a losing record under Mike. But at the same time, it also means you're drafting in the 20s more often than not, and I feel like this is catching up to them because they can't draft the quarterback like they did with Roth, uh, Roethlisberger that can bring them out of this. Yep, you, you hoped um, in, in some way they'd be able to go get a quarterback, but it, it, I'd be remiss if I didn't point out they drafted a 14 two years ago. They traded up to get that spot for, uh, two years ago. I don't think Broderick Jones is even going to start. And based on his performance against Buffalo, 
I, there, there's, I don't know what's going on if they feel that he should start because I, I don't think it would have taken Greg Rousseau, who's a good pass rusher, I don't think it would have taken Greg Rousseau to get three sacks. He gave up three sacks on, on what was it, ten dropbacks? Yeah. He, he was right. miserable. He doesn't look anywhere close to ready to, to defend, uh, to protect the quarterback. Um, that isn't to say Broderick Jones is a bust. I, I, stu- I still think this season he could be among the best run-blocking tackles in, in the game. He's that athletic. He has that kind of power. Uh, and he showed flashes of that last season. But after eight starts at right tackle, after his second training camp, after one full offseason in an NFL program with the money that comes with that, I would have hoped to see a much better player than what I saw on Saturday. That that's you can't start him. You just can't. Uh, people are clamoring about he's getting moved around to different sides of the ball. The things that he's doing are not specific to a side. They're specific to a position and and a general concept of what you're supposed to do. He's off balance. Uh, his his you see it in his feet. You see it in his lower body. He's not going to be effective in pass protection. And whoever is going against him. Uh, teams are going to know he's there, and they're going to come after him for a variety of reasons. The Steelers are going to struggle hugely in protection right now, just based on what we saw, if he's out there. So as odd as this is, they trade up to get Broderick Jones. They draft another tackle the next year who's currently hurt. But if he's healthy, he's going to start. And Troy Fatani is going to be their starting right tackle. And somehow Dan Moore is going to get a fourth year of, of uh, starting action for the Steelers. And I, that, that can't be what they hoped for. Uh, going into this offseason. That had to have been seen as a liability within an offense that has a lot of liabilities. Uh, for them to have not improved in that area, along with the quarterback, is is beyond frustrating. And I, I, I got a bad feeling that's what we're going to see come week one against Atlanta. They have guys that can rush the passer. Um, that's the kind of thing they want to do. They're built to do that. Uh, there, there's going to be problems. You know, <laughs> I'm not sure... Uh, Steeler Nation is going to deal with that for very long. It might even, might not even be a quarter before people are really screaming uh, at Tomlin, at Khan, uh, all the moves that they're making and how they're not really panning out at mm. the, the key areas that they should have addressed two years in a row now. Which then brings us to the other part, and this is the part that, will you know, you either know the game or you don't, but you play offense to your defense, but you play defense to your offense. And if your offense can't move the ball, you are inclined to take fewer chances and play umbrella coverage because I can't afford to give up the big play. I can't afford to do it. Uh, How much of an effect can this lack of offense because of the quarterbacks have on a team that's going to have to rely on its defense? The very, very simple answer is, is not much, but I, I would point out two things first. One, this is a team, the, the only team in NFL history to go three consecutive seasons finishing above 500 with a negative point differential. Okay, that, that's a major, major problem. Um, and two, really shouldn't work this way. <laughs> you know, it, it, right. they haven't addressed it. The question you just asked, we could have asked at any point in the last two seasons. It's the same thing. So, yeah, now the the problem that I have is the offense from a playmaking perspective is potentially worse than it's been. It doesn't seem, just based on limited view, I'm not saying it's everything, but from, from this viewpoint, it doesn't look like their quarterback play will be any better. It doesn't look like their protection will be any better. What's going to be the difference? You hope that Arthur Smith can, can scheme his way around a few of these things, but I, I think you're loading up the same problem. And this is a year again. I mean, I, I've been saying this and trying to, to warn people, pass rushers don't tend to get better with age. They get craftier, but they get hurt more often. They don't play as much. I, it doesn't take long to find statistical evidence to show if T.J. Watt isn't on the field, this team doesn't win. That's it's right. probably because he has to win games on his own. And he might right. be the only defensive player in the league that has to do that. Right. It goes to show his tremendous value to the team, but no other team is built like that. So at what point does the other shoe fall, and what's going to be the consequence of that? You, you can't continue to get subpar NFL quarterback play 
and expect to win games. If they have not fixed that problem, it's even more pressure on a defense that, as, as you well know, had a, an injury to a key player, had a suspension to another key player. Their back secondary was run by undrafted free agents who weren't with the team in training camp at, right. at one point. Um, there's a lot of guys that played significant minutes for them, that are significant snaps for them, that won't be in the league this year. That was their defense last season. They held it together somehow or other. But how often are you going to get away with that? You know, how, how much longer is that going to work? If you have a team that has even less firepower depth-wise offensively than it did, your defense has to be even better than it was. And it didn't work out last season defensively throughout. They, they were a, an excellent unit at times. They did a lot of good things. But asking a defense to, to stand on its head for 18 games – doesn't work in the NFL anymore and if, if you disagree with that I, I suggest you go watch the playoff game against Buffalo it, it yeah. was over at that point you know they were dragging um, I, I don't know if their defense can really overcome that with what they've added uh, and what they have coming back I, I just think it's too much pressure to put on one unit uh, because you again it's 17 weeks you're not going to ha- in all likelihood, T.J. Watt's not playing all 17 games. In all likelihood, Joey Porter Jr. is not playing all 17 games. Same thing for Patrick Queen. On that side of the ball, you almost have to be injury-free to give yourself a chance in every single game. If everything has to work out perfectly in what should be, and a lot of different ways you can take this, but what I mean is the secondary part of the game. Um, the defensive side of the ball. I'm not saying that that's not important, but um, you have to marry the defense with an offense that can beat yeah. you um, in seven possessions. Steelers' offense doesn't score more than three possessions. <laughs> so, right, uh, that's right. And to ask a defense to allow only two is really hard because three scores in a game is way below average. Yeah. So you're asking them to be way above average every single week. It's just simply not going to happen in today's NFL. It doesn't happen anymore. Um, you can have a great unit. It, certainly, you look at Kansas City. Kansas City won the Super Bowl last year on, on the strength of their defense. You yeah. know, I, I've talked a lot here about the, the phenomenal job Cincinnati has done defensively in their playoff runs mm-hmm. the last couple of years. It wasn't Joe yep. Burrow. It was their defense. Right. It, it, it's not that that can't win come January, but they're limping into January with – Honestly, some of the worst stretches of offensive football the league has seen in the last 20 years. If, if you can't get better than 17 points a game, typically, uh, out of your unit, you're simply not going to win. You're not going to compete. And, yeah, to your point, everything needs to go right for you. Cam Hayward's a year older. He's more banged yeah. up. T.J. Watt's a year older. Minka Fitzpatrick, as weird as this is to say, he's a year older. Yep. And it's not like you bolstered a ton of depth because you signed Patrick Queen not even top of market uh, you're not going to get all pro kind of play take over the game kind of play you have to rely on health that's the one thing you can't rely on so it, it's it's a gamble um i i don't know where they're going to be i just know that this really was like okay no messing around anymore we have to fix this offense and they brought in a bunch of, of different guys coaches personnel to do that and I, I don't, mm-hmm. I don't know if what I've seen through two preseason games gives me the sense that they're going to be able to do that. No, I don't, I don't get that either. Now I realize the first round pick from Washington has been banged up. That hasn't helped at all. Roderick Jones, who knows what's going to happen. Frazier looks like he's a good pick as well. You feel like that part should should be better. You would hope so. You would hope so. I, I'd also point out. I think Mason McCormick is possibly. It, it, this isn't the way they'll go, but I, I definitely think they have a winner uh, with McCormick yes. who may have been yep. outplaying James Daniel, who's a, a yeah. very solid NFL guard. Um, nobody, nobody can question their desire to improve their offensive lines out over the last two years. That's They've right. absolutely made that investment. Um, everything that you heard about Satanu, he, he's coming along. I, I thought he was a little bit more polished of a player uh, mm-hmm. coming into the NFL. I thought he would have had a better chance to be a more effective rookie than Jones compared to where Jones was. But it, it, I'm not trying to preach impatience with Broderick Jones, but he's got to be a lot better than he looked yeah. on, on Saturday. And yeah. that, was a, that was a mess. So it, it's 
you don't know if you're getting dividends from that yet. And this is not a team that really can be in a position to wait that long. You know, I get it as a rookie year. I can give him a pass. We saw some rough stuff. We saw some pretty good stuff as well. And I'm, I'm not critiquing him uh, for his, his run-blocking effort performances. But his pass protection is such a liability. They're, they're really not going to be able to pass anything right. five or seven-step drop. And then right. you turn into – Three step and release. The defense knows exactly what you're doing. You don't have the depth uh, to really scheme much of anything, and now you're you're stuck, which is really where they've been the last three seasons. Never stuck with you, my friend. Always appreciate you. Thanks so much. Absolutely. Thanks for having me, guys. Brought to you by NIL Game Changers. Go to nilgamechangers.org on News Radio 1070 WKOK. On a sale with a handshake, a service technician who really knows what he's doing, they can explain it in English what the problem is. There's nothing better than having that friend you could trust in the area. That's Sunbury Motors, where you get selection, knowledgeable salespeople, and prices that fit your budget, and more important, that friend you can trust. Welcome to Sunbury Motors, Kia, Ford, and Hyundai. You could chop other dealers and compare prices, but at Sunbury Motors, you get their lowest price promise. They research the current used vehicle market and guarantee their used car prices are the lowest. If you find a lower price, Sunbury Motors will beat it. Three dealers, all in one. See their full new and pre-owned inventory at sunburymotors.com. Pick out a vehicle you like and schedule your test drive online. Follow them on Facebook. Sunbury Motors Ford and Hyundai, North 4th Street, Sunbury, and Sunbury Motors Kia, routes 11 and 15 in Hummel's Wharf. Hi, this is Season. For over 100 years, the Purdy Insurance Agency has been protecting families and businesses of the greater Susquehanna Valley and beyond. With the experience of our trained and knowledgeable staff, you can rest assured that your needs will be evaluated and met by some of the industry's best representatives. No matter what your insurance needs are, call Purdy Insurance today at 570-286-5855. Visit our website at purdyinsurance.com or check us out on Facebook to see what we can do for you. you an in-depth look at Penn State sports and more. This is the Steve Jones Show on News Radio 1070 WKOK. The Steve Jones Show is presented by Brewers Outlet, NIL Game Changers, Sunbury Motor Company, and Purdy Insurance. Now from the Sunbury Motor Studio, here's Steve Jones. Final half hour being brought to you by our good friends at Purdy Insurance, Market Street and Sunbury. Go to purdyinsurance.com. Auto, home life, business, boat, motorcycle, RV. A lot of insurance needs, and let's face it, it's not just an insurance need. All of us have multiple. They take care of it all and do everything they can to save you money. Customer service means everything to them. At Purdy Insurance, Market Street in Sunbury, go to purdyinsurance.com. Did you see the latest from Oklahoma State, Todd? I did. QR codes on the helmets about donating to NIL. I'm surprised they're the first. Yeah, I'm surprised they're one of the first two. So. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, yeah. <laughs> Just uh, a different world. It is a different world. <laughs> yeah, and, mm-hmm. and he just told Mike Gundy, his team... Don't worry about NIL portal or anything like that. Let's let's go and concentrate on the season. All that stuff's already done. Okay. Right. Never too early to think about next year. Yeah. <laughs> um. Okay. There's this one. Longtime New Mexico State radio announcer Jack Nixon 
will be calling his 45th football and men's basketball season. It's going to be his last one. He said he announced Monday that he's going to retire following this fall. He's part of the New Mexico Sports Hall of Fame. I've never met him. Uh, Broadcasters, uh, New Mexico Broadcasting Association Hall of Fame 2022. It says he's called 400 football games, okay, and over 1,000 men's basketball games since he began in 1979. Now there's this sentence where it's kind of struck me. I'm like, going, okay, because I don't think this is right. He is one of only six radio announcers to have called 1,000 or more men's collegiate basketball games for one school. Really? Because I've done 1,255 Penn State games. (laughs) I don't think I'm one of only six. Because that's the only school I've ever broadcast for. That doesn't make sense. But it's in their notes. Maybe you're an institution, more of an institution than you thought, Steve. No, there are a lot of people who want to institutionalize me. <laughs> I, it's more I'm, I'm being institutionalized instead of being an institution. <laughs> but this is like, it's in the story and it's also in his biography. Because I just saw, like, you know, anytime I see one guy's going to retire, I just want to read a little bit about his career and so forth. That's why I saw it. Like, okay. Um. <laughs> I mean, I can't imagine. You should email the depart the New Mexico SID and say, "Am I one of the six? Yeah, who are the six? Because <laughs> um, the Washington State guy, I think, was there for fifty five years. Bill Hillgrove." Is only called Pitt, right? Uh, um, the guy you talked about at Indiana is probably on there, right? Or oh, he, Don Fisher. Oh, my God, Don Fisher. Yeah. And all he's done is Indiana. Um, now, and Johnny Holiday at Maryland. So, so Don, Johnny, and I are the three guys in the conference over 40 years. So we've all done over 1,000 games. And because of the length of the postseasons, they had to have done more than I have. Because Indiana's, you know, gone to X amount of Final Fours. Maryland's gone to a couple Final Fours. And they're both have been in, like, Johnny's, I'm going to my 43rd. I think Johnny's going into his 45th, something like that. So, I mean, that's just three of us. Right there in one conference. Didn't somebody now, at Kentucky do it forever too? Yeah, but, uh, you're talking about uh, K. Wood Ledford. Yeah, yeah. I think he was there for 39 years, and if you're, he had to have done over a thousand games. I mean, the Kansas guy who's retired. You know, and I got to think Tony Caridi of West Virginia's got to be getting close. Well, although you think about it, you have to get 30 games a year. Just, just to do the basic 30 games a year. I mean, you do have to do it for being your 34th season to get there. And back when I started, I had a few seasons that were 27 games. You know, so you're under. Now the COVID year, what I do, 22 games? I did every game. But I think they only had 22 games, something like that. Maybe 20, maybe it may have been 24. Um, you know, this, this guy says the reason he's doing it is because of travel. I'm 74 years old and the travel has just gotten to me. Well, when you're at New Mexico State, Okay, except for the trip to Albuquerque, you are traveling. I mean, you are all over the place. One of only six radio announcers who called a thousand or more men's collegiate basketball games for one school. 
See, I don't think I know Don. Don's only done Indiana, and Mar- and Johnny's only done Maryland. I've only done Penn State. I don't know. Who knows? It could be right. Because uh, yeah, Jerry Allen, for example, no longer does Oregon. And um, Bob Rondo retired from doing Washington. Hmm, who knows? Ah, but you're right that people do want to institutionalize me. <laughs> I think that's what you said, right? You can go with that. I called you an institution. <laughs> I thought you called for me to be institutionalized. Okay. Uh, I need you here. I don't want to do it by myself. Yeah, there you go. Um, but, yeah, I mean, well, congratulations to him on a great career. Um, and obviously, he loves Las Cruces. Las Cruces loves him. And... Um, the Yankees Tigers game most watched MLB Little League Classic ever. Uh, Little League Classic is a cool thing to begin with. Having the Yankees there makes a big difference. They got 2.169 million viewers. That's a new record. Um, so that's really. Um, that's really cool that it happened. Um, 2025 is the Mets and Mariners. going to be August 17th next year. But, yeah, no, that's, that, that's great. Um, and the peak viewership was 2.369 at the end. That's actually when all the action took place in the ninth and 10th innings. <laughs> That's where all the action was. It's only out of nowhere. Like, hey, who's going to win this game? It's a 39% increase over last year's Nationals-Phillies game. And then there's Christopher Russo. Do you see what he said about Philadelphia fans? Oh, no. no. Oh, yeah, no. Philly fans are going to love this. Let's see. Where is it here? Um, let's see. I know it's here somewhere. But he went after him pretty good. Um, let's see. Because he was talking about the... Uh, Um, he was talking about essentially he says they're incredibly overrated that they have an incredibly high opinion of themselves and he said no not true here we go last idea that Philadelphia being a sports haven is a bunch of nonsense Quote, the sports fan in that town thinks they're better than everybody else. Okay? While talking about fan bases that make him mad, they all do, by the way. But in Atlanta in particular, Russo also rebuked the city of brotherly love. It didn't take long for Christopher Russo to launch into a scathing critique of Philadelphia sports fans, painting them as fickle and undeserving of their reputation as a passionate sports city. Ugh. Game 7, 1981. Okay, so now we're going to go back 43 years. <laughs> Game 7, 1981, second-round playoff series, Bucks sixers That Sixers team with Julius Irving, Bucks team with Bob Lanier, Marcus Johnson, Junior Bridgman. They played in Philadelphia. They both won way over 50 games. It's Mother's Day, seventh game, 99-98 Philadelphia. You know how many people were in the building at the Spectrum? 5,700. I think the actual attendance was about 7,600, but still you get the point. I mean, 7,600 means there were 11,000 empty seats. Do you know how many people were across the street for the Mother's Day Phillies-Cubs game? 30,000. So the idea that Philadelphia, Pennsylvania is some sports haven is a bunch of nonsense. They will jump off the Phillies bandwagon. They were booing them the other night. The Phillies. 
who have done nothing but win in the last three years. They lost to the Marlins, and they booed them in the first inning. Now, that is a fact. Now, that part's not unfactual. That's one thing about Philadelphia fans. Their ability to turn on their team and be detrimental to them is incredible. And I've said for years, I said, look, just just get in front of any time. The key with any Philadelphia team is to get in front of them because their fans won't help them. They'll be mad at them. But God forbid you Philadelphia gets out in front and they will front run their way you know and they will support them to the end. He says they he says they will jump off the bandwagon. He says and forget the Eagles. He says and did you know the year the Eagles won the Super Bowl and Wentz got hurt? Did you know at halftime of a Sunday night game with Nick Foles late in the year when they were 11 and 2 when they got off the field at the half? They were losing 10 nothing and were booed by their fans. Now, that's the year they won the Super Bowl. Now, of course, the Giants were 2-11. and 11. So, <laughs> it should be noted that during this portion of the talk, Russo started to get booed during this portion as he went off the rails. Says the Philadelphia faithful in the crowd, let him have it. Sure, you can accuse the town of being a front runner, but it's hard to argue with the passion being larger than anywhere else. At the same time, most sports cities are front runners. Few places in the country are selling out games unless the team is winning. The American sports culture is that of winning, and the support when they're losing just isn't there. Okay? Russo said, quote, The sports fan in that town thinks they're better than everybody else. New York is better. New York is better. Now the boos, of course, were raining down like large raindrops. Do we know if Chris Russo is still alive? (laughs) <laughs> well, let's start with this. The Sixers have been a frustrating team because they do have talent and truly one of the top 15 players in the league in Joel Embiid, right? Okay? Um, but Philadelphia fans do get, and I'll take Matt as an example, but he, I think he represents a lot of people. They get wound up in the wrong things. Okay? It does not matter whether Joe Allen B is the MVP of the league. It doesn't matter. Now, it matters to Embiid because he gets a bonus and so forth, but if they pick somebody else as the MVP, who cares? It's about winning in the playoffs. Like, for example, I mean, one of these days I'm going to kind of like jab him a little bit and say, geez, how about that Bobby Witt for MVP? You know, Bobby Witt, you know, you realize what he's done in the last 30, 35 games? He's hitting 500. Like, that's over a month hitting 500. I knew he was like that for, like, the first two and a half weeks after the All-Star break. I did not yeah, s- realize he was still that flaming he's, hot. He's kept it going, right? But, like, but I can jab him with that because he'll get into the irrelevancy of Aaron Judge being the MVP. It does not matter. Okay? You can be the MVP all you want. It's winning the World Series is a big deal. Okay? That's a big deal. Stephen A. Smith, former Philadelphia Inquirer reporter, said, you should be drug tested. (laughs) Philadelphia is one of the greatest sports towns in America. You've lost your ever-loving mind. The Sixers, the Eagles, the Phillies, excuse me, to mention the Flyers. Philadelphia is a fantastic, let me tell you something right now. You could say that New York fans overtook Wells Fargo Center during the NBA playoffs, which, by the way, they did. But the matter of fact is, as someone that worked in that city for 17 years, they boo you, they might get disgusted with you, but it's because they hold you accountable. It's a great sports town. You're wrong about the city of Philadelphia. You're wrong. 
That was Stephen A. Smith defending Philly. Now, did Wells Fargo get overtaken by Knicks fans? Yes. That is true. It was kind of like one of those Trojan horse moments. Uh Uh-oh. It was not a great day in Sixers fandom. No, it was not. (laughs) But man, he... You want to talk about two guys, New York versus Philadelphia. What, what, Yankee fans are great fans? But in the number of fights in the stands? Come on. No. Now, is the writer correct that winning creates no doubt? No doubt. Winning is the single greatest marketing tool in the history of America. If you are winning and not drawing, now you have a marketing problem. And that rarely happens. I was going to say, I'm looking at you, Tampa Bay. Oh, that's just cruel. Here on News Radio 1070 WKOK, brought to you by Purdy Insurance. Party time, game time, or just fun time. Doesn't matter what time it is, because it's Brewers Outlet time. The Beverage Supermarket has the area's largest beer selection, imports, microbrews, ciders, and domestics. Pick from over 100 ice-cold 12-packs and dozens of 24-ounce singles. Soda, snacks, hot sauces, fresh roasted peanuts. Make it one-stop party shopping, and don't forget the pickle bar. So whatever you're celebrating or just doing it up, Brewers Outlet, Reagan Street, Sunbury, wants to see you. And thank you for your years of patronage. You want a unique way to display your brand. You need a team of seasoned experts to work with. You want to reach customers who buy. You want NIL Game Changers, a versatile consulting agency powered by former student athletes and coaches who work as NIL sports agents. NIL Game Changers will help you build powerful relationships with customers through compelling stories with student athlete influencers as your leading edge. Finally, we'll equip you with the right media to drive your success home. NILGameChangers.org Building meaningful relationships with your customers. 